Hi, and welcome to the set of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. We're excited to share with you a preview of a few of the upcoming episodes starring the best-selling authors in the world that you'll see in full this winter on seasons one and two of About the Authors TV. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoy. First got me intrigued was that I had always known about their story. I'd always known that Lewis fell in love late in life, that he lost his wife. There's a movie about it, Shadowlands with Anthony Hopkins. He wrote one of the seminal books on grief called A Grief Observed about losing his wife. And it hit me that we didn't know her story. She just shows up and she spends the entire movie of Shadowlands and the entire book of A Grief Observed dying. So who was she? And I knew it was an improbable love story because she was an American woman who was married with two kids. So I was, got curious. And whenever I get curious about something, that usually means there's a story waiting. So I started to dive into her history and was stunned to find this fascinating, powerful, genius woman. She was a, a literal Mensa genius. She, she was a poet and a novelist. She spent all of her life in New York. She won the Yale Younger Poets Award. She learned to read at three years old. She graduated high school when she was 14. And just as important for the story is that she literally changed the last decade of C.S. Lewis's work. Her fingerprints and her influence are all over the last decade of his work. And why didn't I know any of that when I know a lot about Lewis? So I decided the best way to get this information across was in a novel, in a story told from her point of view. Every book for me starts with a spark and I don't ever know. If I went looking for the sparks, I would probably never find them. Um, it's always something that I trip across in, in everyday life or that somebody brings into my path or whatever. So the book of lost friends, um, I was in a committed relationship with another manuscript that was to be my next book. Uh, I had written it. The, the rough draft is always me telling the story to me. And then the second draft is me getting the story ready for someone else to be able to read it. So I had written the first draft of that book before I went on tour for Before We Were Yours. Um, by the time I made it home from tour, Before We Were Yours was hitting the bestseller lists and all that sort of thing. So my task when I finally got home was to edit the manuscript for the, um, for the book that I was writing and uh, that I had written the rough draft to. And I was out on the porch and I loved that book. I loved the piece of history it was based on, et cetera. But um, I had written the rough draft for it. I was home to edit it. Um, I was procrastinating, which people ask if I get writer's block. I don't. I get writer's procrastination. It's, I say it's like sitting down to take the ACT test every time. Um, so yeah, so I was procrastinating. I was looking through the email and I opened an email from a reader who said, I've just read before we were yours and the separated families in the story remind me of some work I've been doing for the historic New Orleans Collection Museum. And to the bottom of this um, note, she attached these old, um, these, these um, scans of these old ads from the late 1800s in this blotchy newsprint of hand crank printing presses, you know, creased and faded and with little dots of ink. And what these were, were uh, ads placed by formerly enslaved people after the Civil War who had been separated from their families during slavery. And this was a, an ingenious, sort of like an early day social media page, because this was an ingenious way of giving the last known information they had about their families and sending these out into this fractious, divided country um, you know, on, on steamboats up the river and in the mailbags of rural mail carriers to see if anyone out there had news of their people and could send it back to them and reconnect these families. So that was the basis of the Book of Lost Friends were these ads. This was definitely, Charlotte was the inspiration for this. Actually, the inspiration for this was women who were nothing like Charlotte. 
And that's, that's what I found interesting because I read a lot about World War II, it's an interest. And I read about so many women who were heroic, who risked their lives spying for the allies and working in the resistance and working to defeat the Nazis. And I started to think, not over a long period of time, I didn't start to think, it kind of evolved. Um, what was it like for women who were not blessed or cursed with that kind of courage? What would it be like for me if I was living in occupied Paris? And then the second part of that is, what will you do to survive as an individual? And what will you do to protect a child? Because you have to figure, you know, many of these women, of course, would have children of all ages. And so um, I started to think of, I mean, Charlotte grew in my mind what her predicament would be, what why she'd be there and how she'd be living. And then uh, Vivi grew up and uh, she was a baby during the occupation. When they came to New York, she was a teenager because of my relationship. I don't have children, my relationship with uh, a particular niece when we, we, while she was still close, while she was growing up, we were very much in each other's lives. So that became part of it. Well, there's so much information obviously on the Holocaust and, uh, and there's quite a bit on on Paris, on, on France, obviously under the occupation. And um, it just, the more you read, the more you realize, realize how terrifying this was. And, and danger lurked all around you. It wasn't just Nazi soldiers or anything. It was neighbors were turning each other and you never knew who was going to report you. Or And the, one of the really interesting things for me is how the same people, there were no, all, well, of course, there were some very evil people and some very heroic people, but the same neighbor could be very generous at one point and for his own, uh, you know, reasons or her own reasons, uh, turn you in for another or th be threatening for another. Um, well, something came to me as I was working about this. I hadn't thought of in years. It had been very much a part of my childhood. Um, my parents went to Europe on their honeymoon. This was about the time Hitler came to power. And they went to see some of my father's relatives. Uh, this was in Poland. And a cousin said, get out now. Do not stay in Poland another day. Now, my parents were American citizens. They'd been born here, but they were Jews. And the feeling was, just get out. It is so dangerous. And I hadn't thought of that. My mother told me the stories when I was a child. I hadn't thought of that in years until I started working on this book. And so that, that was kind of an immediate threat, a sense of the immediate sense of the threat.